So Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this new day that we have. I want to thank you for the talk that we've just been able to listen to, to be able to um, understand and hear the truth of um, the identity and the meaning that you've given to each one of us. Um, that we aren't just wandering this world with no purpose, Lord. And Father, I just want to thank you that we are wonderfully and beautifully made. And I just pray that you may be with us now as um, I speak. May your words be in my mouth. And Lord, may it be practical and a blessing. Um, and I just want to thank you for hearing our prayers. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Did you know that it is impossible to go through life without any sort of stress or anxiety? And did you know that it, you actually don't want to? So studies are showing us that stress and anxiety, when it's a small amount, can be beneficial. It can help us um, get better results when we're trying to perform something. It can help us when we um, to get things done on time. And it's also shown to be good for our immunity. So it's, it's an immunity booster. And it can also, um, it's also a very important part of our fight and flight response. So, you know, our adrenaline in the face of danger. So it's not only beneficial for our body, it's also keeping us safe. But it's when our, um, our anxiety becomes too much, when it becomes uncontrollable, unwarranted, when it com becomes consistent and uncontrollable, that is when it becomes unhealthy and it can actually create a lot of negative impacts, a, a negative impact on our body and our day-to-day -day life. Now, this topic is a very personal topic for me because I have struggled a lot with anxiety in the past and it is also still something that I face today if I don't stay on top of it. So I've always been a very anxious person. When I was a little girl, I was a very tightly wound um, little girl, I would get very anxious very quickly. And um, I still remember my first panic attack where I thought I was going to die and I didn't know why. And, but the thing was, is at the time I thought it was normal. So I thought it was normal to get panic attacks. I thought it was normal not to sleep well at night. And I thought it was normal just to be anxious about day-to-day -day activities that should be normal, uh, a normal, easy thing to go through. But it was in 2015 that I finally realized. Um, in 2015, my panic attacks became very consistent. I would be getting them once a week at least, if not every single day. Um, at nighttime, I would be not sleeping to the point where I would be getting 30 minutes of sleep each night. And um, it got to a point where I was actually afraid of my bed. So every time I was thinking, okay, I'm going to bed, I would start getting a panic attack. I would stress and I, nighttime would just scare me. Not because it was dark, just simply because I, I was constantly getting those anxious thoughts and those panic attacks during that time. And it was this, at this point where I knew this is definitely not normal, this is affecting me and I can't live day to day properly. And I am not the only person who has faced this and is facing this now. So anxiety, is actually one of the most, it's one of the three most common mental health conditions that are being faced in Australia today, along with depression and substance abuse. So before 2020, in around 2017 to 2019, um, there was 4.4 million Australians or 20.9% um, 20 of Australians that were, had reported experiencing anxiety at some point in their life. And to me, that's a, that's a huge number in itself. But after the pandemic, one, within one year, it raised 1.1 million. So 5.5 million Australians suddenly were reporting that they had experienced anxiety at some point. And even now, one in seven Australians are currently experiencing anxiety. So it's a pretty serious thing that we are facing, not only as a nation, but in the world. Yeah. So it's something that we really need to get on top of. But what is anxiety and why is it such a huge concern? So anxiety is the intense, excessive and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. <coughs> and our, your symptoms may look like feeling nervous, restless or tense, having a sense of impending danger, panic or doom, having an increased heart rate, 
breathing rapidly or hyperventilation, sweating, trembling, feeling weak or tired, trouble concentrating or thinking about anything other than, other than the present worry, having trouble sleeping, experiencing gastrointestinal problems, difficulty controlling your worry and the urge to avoid anything that might trigger your anxiety. And, you know, our body, as I've just said before, was made to be able to experience some form of stress and anxiety in your life. But when it's consistent, it can be incredibly bad for our bodies. You know, it can lead to some other physical diseases, but also mental diseases. So some complications that might come from your consistent anxiety might look like weight gain. Um, it can also be um, weight loss as well, depending. Headaches, migraines, dizziness, depression, an increased risk of high blood pressure and heart disease, stomach issues such as stomach pain, stomach aches, and um, there is also a link between anxiety and irritable bowel syndrome. So it's pretty, pretty important. A weakened immune system, which can leave us more vulnerable to viral, viral infections. If you have asthma, you might be experiencing worse symptoms, insomnia, social isolation, and muscle tension. So it's pretty serious. We can see that it can lead to some pretty bad things. And today I want to just be talking about some lifestyle changes that we can make that will um, help us um, help prepare our minds to better, um, better fight the different issues that come up, the different attacks of the mind that might be you know, that we might face from day to day. And we want to do this because it's really important that, um, you know, our bodies, our body and our minds are connected. So if our body is unhealthy, our mind will follow suit. So we want to give our, um, our mind the best chance to be able to fight the thoughts that are coming in. So today I want to be talking about that. And um, I just also want to really address um, you know, Bruce has already talked about the fact that anxiety and depression are a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual attack. So it's not just physical, but Satan is his number one attack, I find, is the mind because we're not taught how to use our minds during, you know, our life. So he knows us and he knows what little thoughts and um, lies to tell us. And um, we... I just, yeah, really am, um, I'm really glad that Bruce and Joy both um, have been focusing on faith and we just had heard a talk about identity because I've found in my own, um, when I've been learning about my own anxiety and patterns that I've seen in other people with anxiety is that one of the main issues is how we view God and his character and how we view ourselves in the light of God's character. So... Let's have a look at some important lifestyle changes. <clears throat> yeah, so the first one is nutrition. And I'm just going to go through this very quickly because I think Christine will be talking about that more deeply tomorrow. But I'm just going to talk about just a few things that we can eat that will help us with anxiety. So tryptophan is essential for the production of serotonin, which is a mood, um, a mood stabilizer and melatonin, which is, um, uh, is, is, which is in charge of our sleep and wake cycle. So both of which are really important for decreasing our anxiety. And some foods that we can get our tryptophan from is pumpkin seeds, walnuts, seaweed, soy, oats. And if you are low in melatonin, you can also eat some oats, bananas, corn, rice, and ginger. And to help our melatonin do its work, we want to be um, high on calcium. We want to have enough calcium. So we can find our calcium from quinoa, beans and legumes, sesame seeds, blackstrap molasses, kale and figs. And to avoid, to things that we need to avoid when we are struggling with anxiety or if we don't want anxiety, is uh, refined sugars. So Refined sugars will cause our blood to our blood sugars to go into roller coaster mode. It will go up, go down, and it will be the same with our anxiety. It will cause our emotions to go up and down as well. So if we are consuming large amounts of processed sugar, we're going to be experiencing a lot more worry, a lot more anxiety, a lot more tense, tenseness, irritableness, and sadness. 
Uh, we want to avoid our refined carbs, which um, is anything that usually starts with white. So white sugar, white rice, white flour, white pasta, white bread, white bread exactly. What so. It's processed, yeah. So you want to get your whole foods. So wholemeal is best or um, I know that Nuri too, she is not here, but you know, she uses the, the buckwheat, the, the many other ones, rice flour and sorghum and yeah. So we want to be filling with the whole foods. So the fruits, the nuts, the grains, the veggies and um, yes. And we want to avoid coffee. So coffee and alcohol are one of the first things that doctors will tell their anxi anxiety patients to stay away from completely. That's the first thing they say, avoid this. Because coffee will reduce your melatonin by six hours, by up to six hours. And alcohol, even though it has the calming effect at the beginning, because you know I've grown up watching TV, I grew up watching TV and movies and listening to music and I heard a lot about how when you come home from a long day of work you just need a glass of wine or a, a beer or something. So even though it has that calming effect at the beginning, it actually reduces your melatonin by 41% and it will increase your tension and again your anxiety. So something really huge to avoid is alcohol. And smoking, I know it's not a food, but you're still ingesting it. It's still going to your mouth. And again, it has the initial calming effect, but it will, again, increase your tension, increase your irritableness, and it is also linked to depression. So really huge things you want to avoid. And this is just a very quick overview. Um, Christine will go through it a lot more and a lot more deeply tomorrow. Um, but... I have recently listened to a doctor on the topic of anxiety and, oh yes, sorry, oh yes, sorry. Do you, what do you think of decaffeinated coffee? Decaffeinated coffee? Um, I think, personally, I wouldn't have it because it's more, it just, it's kind of a link to the coffee. That's the reason why I would avoid it. Did, do you want to say it something? It still has some caffeine. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I didn't know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's Caro, there's um, Nature's Way. Yeah, there are other things that are just completely. Did someone say something? <laughs> um, yeah, so I was talking, I, not talking, I listened to a doctor who was talking about anxiety. So she works with a lot of different um, anxiety patients. I think she is part of the Depression and Recovery Program in America, the on on campus one and so she works with a lot of anxiety patients and she would interview them and as she was interviewing them she found three common denominators that they were lacking and so I'm just going to be going through all those three common denominators and I'm wondering if anyone can guess them because sunshine. sunshine okay anyone else Diet, definitely. Diet. okay <laughs> they're, they're very good they're very important um, the first one, and this is one that I really relate to. This is one that um, is my number one as well, and it is exercise. So amongst all of her anxiety patients, this was something that she found was what they were lacking. So she would ask every single one of her patients, when was the last time that you were able to handle the different stresses and the different you know, situations that came up in your life? And every single one mentioned that it was during a time when they were exercising. And it was once they began to decrease their, their hours of exercise, it was when they became busy, too busy to exercise, that that's when they could not, no longer handle the different stresses in their day. And there's a huge reason for this. I love exercise, so this is um, really, really important for anyone who may be struggling with anxiety. When you exercise, you are releasing very important neurotransmitters into your brain. So um, some of them are endo endorphins and dopamine, which are both part of helping you feel good. They help you feel pleasure. They help you feel satisfaction. And then the endocannabinoids, I don't know how to say it, but that is a neurotransmitter that has been thought to be linked to the runner's high that you feel after you have a vigorous exercise. I'm not sure if anyone has felt that before. 
But yeah, you feel very good when you begin to sweat and you're puffing at the end of a good exercise, you, you, you feel good and that's the runner's high. Um, it's also linked to our neuroplasticity in our brain, which helps us learn and unlearn behaviors and different things. So they've found that people who are trying to fix you know, their problems when they're trying to fix different situations and they're not exercising, they actually find it a lot harder because of this very thing. It, it's a lot harder for them to learn and unlearn the past behaviors that they, they've created as a habit. So it's very critical. It improves our circulation. So exercise maximizes the oxygen that is going to our brain. And I think we've already learned that the frontal lobe is in charge of our memory, our decision making, our character, our personality and our behavior. So when we're exercising, we're increasing the oxygen and we're able to think more clearly, especially when those stresses and those situations come up. And uh, one of my favorite facts that I found is that it is just as effective as antidepressants. So, you know, doctors are saying this, that um, if you're feeling depressed and if you're feeling anxious, it is just as, as effective as an antidepressant pill. So exercise is incredibly important. And when we exercise, just as Jan said, it's really important to do it out in the sunshine because again, sunshine plays a vital, vital role in the um, production of the serotonin. So when you're out in the sun and the sun goes through your retina, it actually um, uh, tells your brain <laughs> to produce serotonin in your body. So, and serotonin again is very important for helping us feel good and it also helps us sleep well at nighttime, which is also very important. Now, our second most common denominator amongst all anxiety patients um, is a lack of water. <laughs> and this is one that really surprised me because I, I never actually thought that water was really linked to my mood. So I was absolutely shocked when I, I found this out, but it makes sense because I have struggled with water in my past. So even though it's small, it's a small thing, you know, we, we commonly think that water isn't that important, um, but it is very important to our mood. Even as little as one to 2% dehydration can have a negative impact on our mood. And there has been extensive studies on this. They found that, you know, they had a study where they got um, people to have a test. And before they had the test, they had some people who were slightly dehydrated and other people who were hydrated, they had the right amount of water. And they found that those who had, who were dehydrated, that they were, they reported being significantly more confused and um, they didn't have as much con concentration. They were more irritable and they were more tense throughout the, um, the test. And um, so water is very important. Um, our body is, you know, all of our body is made up of water. Our brain is known to be made up of 75% um, of our brain tissue is made up of water. So naturally, if you're not drinking enough, your brain is going to become weaker, it's gonna be slower, and it's just not going to work as well as when you're drinking enough. Um, adequate water hydration is important to help our tryptophan turn into serotonin. So again, it's linked to the serotonin and the melatonin, very important. And um, the blood circulation. So when we're drinking water, we're increasing the circulation in our body. It's um, moving through our body better. And when our body is not hydrated, uh, we begin to tense. Our body is tense. And naturally, we have anxious feelings when our whole body is tense and not healthy or working correctly. And also, when we're dehydrated, we have different symptoms along with high um, heart rate higher blood pressure, headaches, muscle fatigue, um, lightheadedness and dizziness. And these are all the very same symptoms as panic attacks. So when you're feeling dehydrated, you are also having the same symptoms that may be triggering, triggering your panic attacks as well. So very important, drink your water <laughs> each day. And 
I think it's time that you are able to drink water now as well. So, although it's small, drink. And now our third common denominator is rest and specifically sleep. And this one I also find to be very unfair because it's like a chicken and the egg situation. Because when you're anxious, you're not going to sleep well at night. And when you're not sleeping well at night, you're going to become anxious. So I, it is a little bit unfair and it's a little bit hard, but um, this is very important. Did some. So uh, studies are showing that when you're not getting regular, consistent and efficient sleep, you uh, it's your, uh, your ability to resist the anxiety is going to decrease as well. And this is where sleep hygiene is very important. So if you are someone who is struggling to sleep well at night, um, you want to be practicing good sleep hygiene. And what sleep hygiene is, is it's the activities that you do surrounding your sleep and it's also during the night as well. So number one thing um, number one is to get to bed on time. So you want to be getting to bed at an early hour between um, 8 to 10, but no later than 10. So, um, and then you want to wake up consistently as well in the early hours of the morning. And um, this is because if your sleep is interrupted, studies are showing that even if your sleep is interrupted during the night, if you're getting a consistent um, if you're going to bed consistently and regularly, then at a regular time, then you're still getting more efficient sleep than if you're just going to bed whenever. <laughs> uh, exercising is also very important. So you want to be getting at least 150 minutes a week because it's shown that 150 minutes a week will significantly increase um, your, your sleep, your efficiency of sleep. And we're all learning to walk 30 minutes after every single meal. So you're definitely getting the, the right amount of exercise. And I am sure that it's helping your, your sleep as well. Our nutrition is very important. We, um, if you are going to be eating three meals a day, you want to make sure that the third meal is light. It's a light meal and it's at least, at, at, as much as you can, three hours before your bedtime. And you want to make that also consistent and regular, and that will help your sleep and wake cycles as well. Complete darkness. Now this is very important because when you are out in the sunshine, your tryptophan is turning into serotonin. And when you're going to bed, your serotonin is then turning into your melatonin. So, and that happens in complete darkness. And so you wanna be getting to bed again between eight to 10, because that's when your body will begin to start producing that melatonin. And studies have also shown that once it's after 10 o'clock, if your lights are still on, your melatonin will begin to deplete. So um, to get the, the most out of the, the healing process of your body, melatonin is really important for your sleep-wake cycle. It's important for healing of your body and, um, you know, making you feel rest, rested in the morning. If you want to get as much as you can, you want to make sure that you're getting um, to bed between 8 to 10. Um, and any light, any light during your sleep will um, also um, affect the way that your melatonin is being uh, produced. Yes. Kayla, when you say any light, uh, I don't have curtains on my, in my bedroom. We yes. the country, and I'm yeah. just talking about starlight, moonlight. Yes, I have heard that even starlight and moonlight can affect the production. So. In those um, moments, because I've gone through those as well, I usually just have either, either a, a t-shirt or if you have one of those masks that you can wear just to cut out all light that's coming through. Yeah. And bed is only for sleeping. So this is a hard one because I know that a lot of people might be um, doing some things in bed that they shouldn't be, but bed is not for work. It's not for reading, it is not for TV or your phone, and it is not for sitting awake and worrying at night time. So if you are struggling to fall asleep, for if you've gone to bed and you have not fallen asleep within 20 minutes, then um, the doctors, especially to those who are struggling with anxiety, tell them to get out of bed and maybe read, pray, you know, spend some time with God. And when you're feeling that dra drowsiness come back, go back to bed and start again because 
especially for those with anxiety, and I can attest to this, is that if you're in bed and you're feeling stressed and you're constantly thinking about all your anxious thoughts, you're going to start getting more anxious even at the thought of bed and even at the, the sight of your bed. So you want to keep your bed for sleeping. <laughs> yeah yeah so um one thing that they say is when you get into bed um, find a comfortable position and lay there just lay in that position for 20 minutes and if within those 20 minutes you're not falling asleep that's when you get out and you know do something else and then come back and try again and once you've gone to bed don't look at your clock and I am sure a lot of people have experienced this. If you've had an important meeting at six o'clock in the morning or five, uh, you, know, you know, you have to get up at six o'clock to get to your meeting or something, you know, this is the time I'll go to bed early, I'll get enough sleep and then you don't fall asleep for an hour. And then you look at the clock and you go, okay, that's less time than I thought. So you try and go back to sleep and it's been another two hours and you look at the clock and you think, oh no, now it's about five hours sleep that I'm gonna be getting, I'm gonna be so tired. And then you start stressing and stressing and stressing and you don't fall asleep because the anxious thoughts are coming into your mind. So don't look at your clock, whatever you do. If you need to put it across the room, do it. If you, uh, my phone is what I use to um, have my alarm. And I've actually found a function on my phone where I can turn off the phone. Um, I can actually set the automatic. So it turns off one hour before going to bed and I can turn it, um, turn it back on automatically while I'm sleeping an hour before I need to wake up. So if you have that function, that will definitely stop you from looking at your phone during the sleeping hours. But studies show that those who are practicing good sleep hygiene, they're getting um, the most efficient sleep that they can compared to those who aren't practicing these, um, these things. So very important. So oftentimes we can take a lot on for ourselves, can't we? You know, we feel like we constantly need to be working. We need to be studying. We need to be doing something, helping people and, and um, you know, carrying all our burdens. And especially as Christians, you know, Bruce said that um, idleness is the devil's playground. And that is very true. So we think that we constantly need to be doing something because it's wrong to stop. But Ellen White actually says, and Jesus, I actually really like the fact that you know, his life was probably the most busiest, wasn't he? He was always working. He was ministering to people constantly. And, you know, but he still found the time to set apart, to go by himself and to rest. And he spent that time with God. So it's really important. Rest is very important. And mind, character and personality, it says it is not work, but overwork. Without periods of rest that breaks people down, endangering the life forces. So when you are feeling that overwork, that doesn't mean, okay, I'm gonna sit on the couch and I'm gonna just sit on my phone and do whatever I want, and I'm not going to do anything, but it means that, you know, it's time to rest. God has given us a body. He's given us a mind for us to look after. It's our responsibility to, to look after ourselves. So it's, you know, we, sometimes we need to prioritize our health. And if we are following Jesus' example, what was the best thing that he did during those times of rest? It was spending time with God, wasn't it? So in our times of rest, that's the time that we set apart for God. Growing up, I was very much taught. I find this to be the most important thing that I feel like I have learned so far, <laughs> is that while I was growing up, I was taught constantly is that if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling depressed, then you're not with God or you're not a real Christian. And as someone who was struggling with both of these things at the time, I found this incredibly discouraging. I found that I would have trouble th with thoughts of, okay, I must be really fake. I must not be a Christian. All this time that I have spent, you know, trying to have a relationship with God must be completely in vain because I'm still feeling a little bit anxious. I'm still feeling fears here and there and I must not be doing, I, I must not be a Christian. So it was very discouraging for me. But I, I'm not sure if any of you have um, heard, I'm sure you all have heard some stories of people who have been smoking for a long time and then they gave their life to God. And when they gave their life to God, that was it, cold turkey. They stopped smoking, no more temptations, they, that was it. They were done, they were healed. 
Have you heard those stories? I've heard so many of those stories and I love them because they're such a testament to God's power, you know, his transformation. They gave their life to God and that was it. They felt no more temptations. They felt no more. They didn't need to smoke anymore. And that was, that was it. But then what about those stories about the people who have given their lives to God? They, they have the same struggle, but that wasn't it for them. You know, they tried giving up the, the cigarettes, they put it down. And then a week later, they had to pick it up again. Or if they didn't have to, but they did and they fell. Do you think that that, that means that, God wasn't, that God's not with them? That his transforming power isn't working in their lives? No. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16, for a just man falls seven times and rises up again. And it, I think it's the exact same with anxiety. You know, you might, you know, experience that freedom from panic attacks, from all that overwhelming thoughts, the fears, everything. You might experience that freedom, but you also might not. It might be a step by step process and you might have to be learning as you go how to overcome everything with Jesus. And a quote from Steps to Christ says, As with life, so it is with growth. It is God who brings the bud to bloom and the flower to fruit. It is by his power that the seed develops, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. The plants and flowers grow not by their own care or anxiety or effort, but by receiving that which God has furnished to minister to their life. The child cannot, by any anxiety or power of its own, add to its stature. No more can you, by any anxiety or effort of yourself, secure spiritual growth. The plant, the child, grows by receiving from its surroundings that which ministers to its life, air, sunshine, and food. What these gifts of nature are to animal and plant, such is Christ to those who trust in him. And how quickly do plants grow? It depends. <laughs> it depends on the plant and also depends on the circumstances. We actually have a friend who lives around the area. This is him. Um, he loves growing trees. He absolutely loves trees. And one of his favorites is the avocados. And this is him tending to his avocados. He's grafting them, so he really loves them. He starts them from the very beginning. And these are also his um, avocado trees. They're not his best avocado trees, by the way. They're actually a little bit um, they've, they've gone through the circumstances of life. <laughs> but I remember when he first started growing his avocados, when he first thought, you know, I'm going to grow avocados. I love eating them. So I want to grow them. I want the fruit. He, um, he planted his trees and he tended to them, but he struggled. And, you know, it got a few years past and around the year when, you know, normal avocado trees would start producing their fruit, his plants would produce a flower and then it would start turning into a fruit and then the fruit would just fall off and all of them would just do this. And, you know, this could be very discouraging, right? He could look at the other trees and go, they're growing. <laughs> they're growing their, their, um, their fruit. I might as well just give up. These, these trees aren't just not going to do it for me. But he understood a vital thing. He understood that avocados grow in warmer, in a warmer climate usually. That's where they flourish. And you can see them in Queensland, WA, even in Victoria, they're in the higher areas. He's right down the bottom. <laughs> so he understood that that's where they flourish. So he just needed to wait and he needed to allow his trees to get stronger and to grow more so that they can hold on throughout the fr frost and our cold winters. And I still actually really remember when he first got a fruit. He would take pictures of it and he would send it to all of us and just be like, I got my fruit, you know, he's so excited. He didn't actually get to eat it, unfortunately. He lost it. I don't know how you lose a fruit, but <laughs> he, he lost his first fruit. This past year, this is his fruit. And this past year, he has been eating in abundance. And I can tell you, I chose my friend wisely because I have been working for him gardening and I get paid in avocados. I go back to my car and there's avocados in my car and oh, it's just oh, best avocados I've ever tasted. Huge and his whole house, you would go in and they're on the table, they're on the bench and just, just eating them in abundance. But those trees could not speed up the process. They, they couldn't grow 
faster than they, they were growing. And he couldn't speed up, well, he could have sped up the process, but he would have made them weaker. So what he had to do is he had to be patient. He had to tend to them as they needed, you know, trim them to encourage their growth and their strength. He couldn't speed up their process. And God is the exact same with us. You know, he understands us even more than my friend understood his avocado trees. He doesn't look at us and go, you know, you're getting anxiety when this person is handling that really well and you, you shouldn't be feeling depressed. This person isn't feeling depressed. What are you doing? I'm going to give up on you. He understands that we need to grow and we need to, he just needs to encourage us as we grow. Now, I want to look in the Bible because the Bible is our, is our instruction book, isn't it? So I want to look at an example in the Bible of someone I really relate to who went through anxiety. But more importantly, I really want to look at how God handled the situation. So um, if we can turn to Exodus 3.11, and this is the story of Moses. So this is where Moses has um, found the burning bush. So he's found God in the burning bush and God is telling him to go to Egypt to free his people. And let's, and as God is telling Moses to free his people, Moses is, oh, Exodus, I mean, uh, Genesis, there we go. Um, as God is telling Moses to free his people, Moses is finding any excuse to not go. So let's look at the first thing that he tells, um, he tells God. So Exodus 3.11 says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And that's a pretty fair question, isn't it? Like, you know, he's been tending sheep for 40 years. He's been a shepherd. Who is he? Who is he to go before Pharaoh and tell him to free his people? But God says, I will certainly be with you. So God answers that question. And then in, we're going to jump to Exodus 4.1. After God tells him what to tell his people, um, what to tell Israel. Um, in uh, four, chapter, verse, chapter 4, verse 1, Moses tells God, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So then the Lord answers him with giving him a sign saying, you know, take this rod, turns it into a snake, you know, turns it back into a rod and says, this will be your sign. The people will believe you. So then Moses goes to the next um, thing that he tells God. And that's in verse 10. And it says, Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So now, you know, after God had already shown him a miracle, Moses is still going, but, but, you know, I, I'm not a good speaker. But, Moses, but Lord, the Lord is even patient with him there and he answers him as well. Who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. And now Moses has nothing left. So he finally says the anxious thought that's finally on his heart. And he says in um, chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So he's finally said it, right? Send anyone else. I don't want to do this. Please send someone else. I'm, I, I just don't want to be the one. And I, I, I love this because I can very much relate. <laughs> um, but I feel like in this, you can really see what anxiety is as well. Anxiety is um, the reliance upon self. You know, he was saying, who am I? Who am I to do this? I can't speak. What if they don't believe me? Who am I? You know, I'm just a shepherd. So he was relying upon himself. And at the same time, he was believing that God wouldn't or couldn't do what he was promising him. So... Let's look at how God dealt with Moses, because this is what I really love. And it's in verse 14. It says, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And when I first read this, I thought, oh no, <laughs> rebuke. 
<laughs> this is not going to go well. But it's the, re the reason why is because I'm used to anger in the world. But when you look at God's anger, look at the way that he, he deals with Moses. It's really nice. Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And, I, and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take his, this rod in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. So rather than yelling, and rather than going, okay, you're not going to do the work, I'll get someone else. Uh, God answers him in a way that I really love, because he, he answers when Moses says, get someone else. God says, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you your brother, Moses, uh, bra brother Aaron to speak for you. So he still gets Moses to push himself. He understood Moses's heart and his sincerity, and he continued to work with him and to continue allowing him to grow to the point where, you know, the anxieties of the past are no longer affecting him. I really love it. And the Lord is working with us the exact same way that he is working with Moses. You know, he is, he doesn't leave us where we are. He might understand our weaknesses and go, okay, for this time, I will give you what you ask, but I still want you to push yourself a little bit. He'll send little tests to make us grow. And it's during these times that we need to claim our promises and we need to focus on the Bible and we need to um, look to, to the word. And there are so many, this is only just a few that um, I found, um, just a few. And I, I just... Yeah, he, he really is um, understanding of our weaknesses and our anxieties. And I just want to close on a final quote that I love. It says, By taking one step up after another, the highest ascent may be climbed and the summit of the mount may be reached at last. Do not become overwhelmed with the great amount of work you must do in your lifetime, for you are not required to do it all at once. Let every power of your being go to each day's work <laughs> Improve each precious opportunity, appreciate the helps that God gives you, and make advancement up the ladder of progress step by step. Remember that you are to live but one day at a time, that God has given you one day, and heavenly records will show you, show how you have valued its privileges and opportunities. May you so improve every day given you of God, that at last you may hear the Master say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So I hope this presentation has been helpful and I hope that it has been a blessing <laughs> and practical. Now let's um, close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your love and for your understanding. I want to thank you for the many, um, many things that you have given us uh, physically and in our lifestyle that we can change to help further improve our mind. But I want to thank you so much for just um, your word and for the way that you work with us, that you don't push us, um, but you work with us. You slow down and you allow us to go step by step. And Father, I just want to thank you for the victory that we can claim in you, that um, at the end, we may be able to shine your characters completely as you have called us to. And Lord, I just want to pray that as we um, go into uh, the rest of the day, that we may have you by our side and may our thoughts be only upon you. I just want to thank you for your love and for your continual mercy. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.